How's everybody doing tonight? I wish I could be with you in person, but we're still remotely learning from one another. I hope you're all staying safe and healthy, and I hope to see you soon on the other side of this. I want to thank the Missouri River Regional Library, Lincoln University, and the wonderful partnership between them. The LUMRRL Lecture Series for asking me to talk with you this evening, especially Dr. Christine Boston from Lincoln and Madeline from the library. I also wanna send out a good word to my students and colleagues at Lincoln University. Thank you for your continual support and encouragement. And I hope you enjoy the talk tonight. When I was first asked what I wanted to speak about tonight, I knew straight off that I'd revisit a talk I gave at the 10th Annual Philosophy Conference at Lincoln University a few years ago. Puzzling that talk together changed how I thought about poetry, how I approached teaching poems to my students, and even how I went about writing my own work. I knew that coming back to this topic and how fun it is to ask or to be asked an unanswerable question, then try to answer it in front of people for a long stretch of time, and I guess by distance also, how fun that can be. I hope you'll excuse the fact that I cannot and will not tell you what to read or how to think or even to care about poetry. I watched Dr. Bruce Ballard walk from my office one morning in 2008, just after asking me to deliver a talk for the university. I closed my eyes, took a few deep breaths. I imagined how I might have answered the question, what makes good poetry? Had he asked me that on the spot, in conversation? This isn't really very far-fetched. Dr. Ballard occasionally knocks on my door and he pushes poems into my hands. Read this, he'll say. I think you'll love it. So, eyes shut. I imagine how a good poem feels when I receive it. It feels like a December evening, 1884, in Arles, France, and someone slips into a brothel and they find me. I'm a woman named Rachel. I look up and the visitor hands me the lower part of his left ear and says, keep this object carefully. Who on earth can know what makes good poetry? It's probably not going to be enough to tell you, I just know it when I see it. That worked for a Supreme Court justice when describing pornography, but something tells me it's not going to be enough to satisfy your question. Ten poets could speak on this subject today, and maybe two of them would agree about what makes good poetry. It's not that poets are fickle. Well, yeah, that probably has something to do with it. It's just that judging the quality of a poem is highly personal, subjective. I asked my friend, Mississippi poet Jamie Dixon, what he'd tell a guy who asked him this question in a low-lit bar. He said, quote, Good poetry is something that makes me think or feel in a direction I hadn't before. This is a good answer. It's an answer that might even extend the conversation well into the night. I put the same question to my poet friend Jess Smith. Jess said, what makes good poetry is that it, quote, describes and replicates human experience. That answer deserves another round of whatever she's having. Claire McQuarrie, winner of the Crab Orchard Series and Poetry First Book Award, tells me that you can tell a good poem when it, when it sounds and choice of words matter just as much as what the poem is about. Fair enough. In fact, one might argue this truth when looking at poets from uh, Sophia Alillo and Denez Smith, Elizabeth Acevedo to Dylan Thomas. Chicago poet and playwright Jimmy Cumby tells me that a great poem is like if your best friend materialized before you at sundown on the edge of town 
to whisper a sudden revelation into your ear while handing you a bouquet of wildflowers before turning away to disappear down the darkening street. First, that sounds an awful lot like my description of Van Gogh uh, handing his severed ear to Rachel and the bordello. Second, though, he's not at all answering the question of what makes good poetry. Would it feel like what it feels like to receive a good poem? Absolutely. Well, maybe we need to start with some definitions of poem. But as you might have guessed, opinions vary on this too. Each semester before our senior English majors can graduate, we compel them to compile a senior portfolio. They must write reflective essays and collect critical and creative writing to show proof of their accomplishments. More daunting, though, is the necessity that a committee of professors read the portfolio and question them about both it and their general experience in the program and the wider university. One of my peers, Dr. Brian Sammons, without fail, asks students a question, baffling them every time. What is poetry, he says, and settles back in his chair like this. I watch the terror cloud across their eyes as they fumble to answer the question. What is poetry? Well, as you might have guessed, there's plenty of folks who are more than willing to define poem for you. Dante said simply, poetry is things that are true expressed in words that are beautiful. W.H. Auden said, a poem is a verbal artifact which must be as skillfully and solidly constructed as a table or a motorcycle. Before Auden, Coleridge simply said a poem equals the best words in the best order. I like this simple answer, and we must remember this is the man who brought us the memorable quatrain, God save thee, ancient mariner, from the fiends that plague thee thus. Why lookest thou so? With my crossbow, I shot the albatross. Coleridge's dear friend William Wordsworth called poetry the spontaneous overflow of powerful feelings recollected in tranquility. And we see that recollection at work in poems he wrote, such as I Wandered Lonely as a Cloud, where he lies back on his couch in the Lake District, and in his unlimited imagination, his inward eye remembers the daffodils. Argentinian writer Jorge Luis Borges believed poetry is something that cannot be defined without oversimplifying it. It would be like attempting to define the color yellow, love, the fall of leaves in autumn. If Borges is correct, defining poetry, much less defining what makes good poetry, is impossible. But let's Irish poet Seamus Heaney told us poetry is language in orbit. What does this all add up to? Well, for starters, no culture ever to exist on this planet has been without its makers and its poets. But coming up with an actual suitable definition for the poem is pretty much impossible. No wonder so many students arrive for the first time in the university classroom with something of a grudge against poetry. They've been raised to distrust it. I find that folks fear a poet is merely someone who knows something and wastes her good opportunity making it unknowable. What do we want from poems? All I ask of my students is that they write poems that make sense and are also unexplainable, though not indecipherable. I ask them to remember that purposefully making a poem difficult in no way mo makes that poem deep. Maybe New Hampshire fifth grader Ethan Richard in 2010 had it right when asked what poetry has meant to him. Uh, Ethan Richard, that fifth grader, said, Poetry is like a very well-read three-year-old. It uses terrific words, but uses them so strangely, and it always spouts the truth you don't want other people to hear in public. It'll act all cute and funny and make you smile for its cleverness, then keep you up all night yelling and screaming about something you don't understand at all. I think young Ethan might have it just about right. I imagine this is exactly how it feels for a fifth grader to try and take in a confounding poem. This is why when I teach poetry, 
I make it clear that a good poem is successful by making use of common sense, not by relying on intricate puzzles that seem more like advanced calculus. Uh, poet and Loyola creative writing professor Mark Yakich in a 2013 piece for The Atlantic wrote, in high school, my English teacher handed me Matthew Arnold's Dover Beach and said I had to write an essay about what it meant. I couldn't make heads or tails out of the assignment and the poem became the object of my hatred. The poem seemed willfully not to make sense, he says. I soon found every poem to be an irritation, a blotch of words, a ludicrous puzzle that got in the way of true understanding as well as true feeling. In her book, Don't Read Poetry, Poet and literary critic Stephanie Burt talks about her fear and frustration that teachers, professors, and their textbooks tell too many potential readers of poetry that poetry is one thing, that a poem has one meaning. All too often a reader will be told Robert Frost is poetry, Sylvia Plath is poetry, Claudia Rankine is poetry. It's true that we can easily fall in love with those writers' poems and might possibly even formulate the belief that every poem should sound like a Robert Frost poem, and every poem should look like a Claudia Rankin poem. Obviously then, if Frost leaves you cold, and you've been told that Frost is poetry, you'll likely pass by poetry, like a woodpile in the middle of a forest, and leave it to its slow, smokeless burning of decay. Bert says this kind of giving up on poetry is, quote, like hearing Beethoven or hearing Kendrick Lamar and not getting into it and then deciding you don't like music. There's other kinds of music and other ways to listen to music out there. And if you look and listen and ask the right people, you can probably find one that works for you. What makes a good poem? It's impossible to define. Poems have a knack of coming to us when we need them most. It takes many different styles, tastes, experiences, and imaginations to create these artful frameworks that reach out and mean something to us as readers. I'd like to use another wonderful illustration from Stephanie Burt's book, Don't Read Poetry. She calls it her cartoon analogy, and she writes, if you or someone in your house play or watch Pokemon, you may be aware there are a lot of Pokemon, small cartoon monsters that sometimes turn into one another, each with a different skill. Poems and poets differ in their ability. Even though they exist in the same universe and follow the same basic rules, you might ask Wartortle to put out a fire. But if you want to start one, Charmander is the better choice. Similarly, we shouldn't hold poems that put out fires that calm us down, let us escape daily life or reassure us in lower esteem than poems that start fires or unsettle us, or challenge us. Sometimes we need help calming down in a frightening world. Clearly there has been a long line of teachers and professors who in my life have been more than willing to provide examples of what they think makes good poetry. We all have objective standards of judging art, how we see beauty in the world, what we recognize as truth, to make matters trickier, the things you or I find compelling and the reasons you or I find them compelling change over time. What we once found attractive, now isn't. What wasn't becomes attractive. My challenge then has been to choose what I like, and I found what I like to have continuity. In poems I consider to be good, the speaker's voice must sound like the real voice of a real person. British poet Wendy Cope says, some insecure people use a special voice on the telephone that sounds quite different from the way they usually speak. Inexperienced writers sometimes do something similar in their poems using poetic language that they would never employ in ordinary speech or reaching for cliches because they lack the confidence or the energy to find their own unique ways of expressing themselves. So the voice in a good poem must sound and feel authentic. When asked what he looks for in poems, poet Dave Smith says that sense of weight, significance, power, scope, and more than anything else, repeatability is what I want in a poem, says Dave Smith. 
I find repeatability in his poem, Wreck in the Woods. Wreck in the Woods by Dave Smith. Under that embrace of wild saplings held fast, surrounded by troops of white mushrooms, by wrens visiting like news burden ministers, known only to some dim life inside, this model A Ford, like my grandfather's, entered the earth. What were fenders, hood, doors? No one washed, polished, grazed with a tip of finger or boyhood dream. I stood where silky blue above went wind rent. Pine, oaks, dogwood ticking, pushing as if grief called families to see what none understood. What plot of words, what heart shudder of men, women, here ended so hard, the green world must hide it. Headlights, large, round, two pieces of shattered glass. The scene might not fit the classic conception of beauty. This is, of course, if we still subscribe to any concept in which we all share a sense of what beauty means what it looks like, what it sounds like, its scent, and on and on. We have a picture of an old, completely wrecked car, pulled to or abandoned in the woods. We see how nature has overtaken the car, how the green world hides the men, women, that here ended so hard. We see the headlights, large, round, like eyes before a crash. We see two pieces of shattered glass, Bob Dylan didn't think of this first, but he said it best when he said, I see beauty where others don't. This makes a good poem. What makes a good poem? Action does. In fact, let's talk about verbs. Verbs, as we learn early, are the engines of the sentence. If our sentences lack good verbs, our poems lack good sentences. And we find out quickly what does not make for a good poem ask my students. They will tell you how much I harp on this. When we write in any genre, good verbs power our movement. They march us into glory. I go so far as to force my students to imagine gladiatorial matches between verbs. I realize this sounds ridiculous. I learned it from a mentor. Uh, they must close their eyes and imagine two verbs fighting one another in a steel cage match to the death. Weakling verbs like is was and are, they die first. Notice I didn't say are the first to die. Uh, perish, die, obliterates, are. I also suggest my students cut at least half the adjectives and adverbs in their poems before submitting them. Picture your sentences as closed lines. Too many adjectives weigh down the line like wet sweaters. Pretty soon the sentence droops and breaks. One of the best writing instructors I've ever had once told me, if I have to use an adverb, I've probably chosen the wrong verb. Simple tricks, nuts and bolts, yes and yes. And remember, rules are made to be broken. This is a cliche. So is love is a battlefield and war is hell. Avoid those two. What makes a good poem? Imagery, imagery, imagery. You've heard it said one must show, not tell. Particulars construct the language of good poems. You might even have heard that Ezra Pound once said to, quote, go in fear of abstractions. An abstraction simply is something that exists only as an idea, something that you cannot experience with your five senses. Love, hate, faith, sadness, on and on. Go in fear of those things in poetry. Frank Bedart said, abstractions can smother the quick of feeling in a poem. To write a good poem about love with a capital L, it won't be enough to merely say you love something. The reader must taste it, smell it, hear it, touch it, see it. Then the reader will know how your love is different than her love. I must also tell you, though, Bedart goes on to say that when William Carlos Williams said, no ideas but in things, he didn't mean no ideas. So a good poet includes these abstract ideas sometimes abstractly, but finds her surest successful footing when image-making. Donald Hall once said, 
good poetry is the perfect machine of language. When we look at a good poem's words, we realize the complications of feelings that control them. We look for good poems to be complex in feeling, emotional density embodied in images. Poems that move me almost always have intense language in these types of images. They also contain an interesting speaker and what I have called some matter of crisis in human endeavor. Or what I've heard called that. Here's Donald Hall's Adultery at 40. At the shower's head, high over the porcelain moonscape, a water drop gathers itself darkly, hangs, shakes, trembles, and hesitates, uncertain which direction to hurl itself. Listen to the verbs. Gathers, hangs, shakes, trembles, hesitates. Notice how few adverbs, darkly. Hall's poem creates incredible tension through a water drop's journey. Imagine that. Because we communicate through tone, we can determine a good poem's tone. Poems often fail by not making tone clear enough. This poem does not have that problem. The image of the porcelain moonscape so precisely depicts the tub below, empty, barren, not quite white. And we come face to face with this personified water drop, gathering itself up for a great moment of decision. It hangs there, shakes, trembles, and hesitates. It doesn't yet know which way to fall. And is this poem not the perfect little machine to express this instant of indecision? the crisis of human endeavor the poet is either going through or imagining. Hall accomplishes this by writing good poetry. He's built this poem machine of language we can now return to and take apart piece by piece in order to understand how it successfully runs. But let's now slip on our headband magnifiers and lean in to examine this poem. What makes a shower head drip? It could be a worn out O-ring or faucet washer, or a diverter. Maybe mineral deposits or grit amassed inside the head, build up from over the years. At 40, perhaps the poet is comparing this wearing out, this building up and calcifying to how a marriage has seasoned. Not only is the image of Hall's water drop beautifully and darkly unsettling, but it works on several metaphorical levels. When we think of possible reasons the drop finds itself in this position, we're forced to think of the possible reasons this human being finds themselves in a position of making a decision such as this. Also, notice we don't know what decision is made. We never see the drop fall. We are left to wonder. The poem reinforces the fact that none of us knows what comes next. The title might give us some hint at what happens, adultery at 40, but it's never stated outright. This moment caught by Hall is just that, a moment. And look how successfully a good poem can capture that. One last note on Adultery at 40. Notice the title gives us information important to understanding the poem as a whole. How does the poem change if it had been called The First Kiss or Choosing Lincoln over Mizzou? A good poem's title does work. What makes a good poem? Bluesman Willie Dixon once said, the whole of life expresses the blues. That's why I always say the blues are the true facts of life expressed in words and song, inspiration, feeling, and understanding. Dixon is, after all, the guy who wrote this metaphorical stanza about a cheating wife for the great Hal and Wolf. Here's that stanza. Well, long way from home and can't sleep at all. You know another mule is kicking in your stall. The facts of life, skillfully and solidly constructed as if it were a table or a motorcycle. Auden might have been onto something there. He also said, good art is a source of joy that can help us to enjoy life or to endure it a little better. Poet Major Jackson would certainly agree with Auden on this point, but here he writes a poem about death, a preoccupation of many a poet. Uh, while also writing a poem about 
How Life Happens to Us in the Meantime On Disappearing by Major Jackson I have not disappeared. The boulevard is full of my steps. The sky is full of my thinking. An archbishop prays for my soul, even though we only met once, and even then he was busy waving at a congregation. The ticking clocks in Vermont sway back and forth as though sweeping up my eyes and my tattoos and my metaphors, and what comes up are the great paragraphs of dust, which also carry motes of my existence. I have not disappeared. My wife quivers inside a kiss. My pulse was given to her many times in many countries. The chunks of bread we dip in olive oil is communion with our ancestors who also have not disappeared. Their delicate songs I wear on my eyelids. Their smiles have given me freedom, which is a crater I keep falling in. When I bite into the two halves of an orange whose cross-section resembles my lungs, a delta of juices bursts down my chin and, like magic, makes me appear to those who think I've disappeared. It's too bad war makes people disappear like chess pieces, and that prisons turn prisoners into movie endings. When I fade into the mountains on a forest trail, I still have not disappeared, even though its green facade turns my arms and legs into branches of oak. It is then I belong to a southerly wind, which by now you have mistaken as me nodding back and forth like a Hasid in my prayer or a mother who has just lost her son to gunfire in Detroit, I have not disappeared. In my children, I see my bulging face pressing further into the mysteries. In a library in Tucson, on a plain above Buenos Aires, on a field where nearby burns a controlled fire, I am held by a professor, a general, and a photographer. One burns a finely wrapped cigar, then sniffs the scented pages of my books, scouring for the bitter smell of control. I hold him in my mind like a chalice. I have not disappeared. I swish the amber hue of lager on my tongue and ponder the drilling rigs in the Gulf of Alaska and the oil-painted plovers. When we talk about limits, we disappear. In Jasper, Texas, you can disappear on a strip of gravel. I am a shrug of a life in a sacred language. Right now, termites toil over a grave. My mind is a ravine of yesterdays. At a glance from across the room, I wear September on my face, which is eternal and does not disappear, even if you close your eyes once and for all, simultaneously, like two coffins. Major Jackson has this to say about on disappearing. He said, we're surrounded on all sides by the persistence of death and its implications. One could argue, as many have done, uh, that all that we do is a compensation for this fact, including writing a poem. As Jackson has also said, he, quote, writes poems to overcome fretfulness and to mark his days. We understand from Jackson's work that in the span of moments, a shrug of life, one might eat the two halves of an orange kiss his wife, or find himself dragged three miles from a pickup truck in Jasper, Texas, as James Byrd Jr. did in 1998. The result of these ideas mixed with this richness of language is remarkably powerful. Well, what is the power of poetry? When you start thinking of poetry this way, a place to find truth about life, not cliches or abstractions, but these real vital moments what makes a good poem suddenly becomes a lot clearer. We find it in Sun House's blues lyric from Death Letter Blues, in which a man receives word his lover has died. The lyric goes, You know I grabbed up my suitcase, took off down the road. When I got there, she was lying on the cooling board. Sun House is talking about death the same way Japanese artist and poet Taniguchi Busan did 250 years before him. In The Piercing Chill I Feel, Busan wrote, 
The piercing chill I feel, my dead wife's comb in our bedroom under my heel. Let's look at how the late Claudia Emerson channels power of poetry in her poem about death and how a person's artifacts live on after them. Artifact by Claudia Emerson. For three years, you lived in your house just as it was before she died. Your wedding portrait on the mantel, her clothes hanging in the closet, her hair still in the brush. You have told me you gave it all away then. Sold the house, keeping the confirmation cross she wore, her name in cursive chased on the gold underside, your ring in the same box, those photographs you still avoid, and the quilt you spread on the borrowed bed, small things. Months after we met, you told me she'd made it. After we'd slept already beneath its loft and thinning, raveled pattern, as though beneath her shadow, moving with us, that dark, that soft. Emerson, who died two hours before my own mother did in December of 2014, also from cancer, speaks about the artifacts a widower keeps and cannot bear to keep or even look at. It's also a poem about what one lover tells the other, and also what they withhold. One artifact, a quilt made by the late wife, covers them as the widower and speaker make love. Well, what leads to writing a good poem? Uninterrupted thinking, solitude, switching the phone to off. The world clamors for our attention, when life gifts us those sweet, spare moments to ourselves, the quiet moments, our first instinct is to check to see what's outside ourselves on social media, on the internet. Unplug it all, if just for a few good moments. Explore your own internal terrain, as Yusuf Komenyaka says. This helps us to become more human. Komenyaka had to face his service in the Vietnam War. He wrote Dien Cai Dao, a book of good poems about it. The most famous is his poem, Facing It. Facing It by Yusuf Komenyaka. My black face fades, hiding inside the black granite. I said I wouldn't, damn it, no tears. I'm stone, I'm flesh. My clouded reflection eyes me like a bird of prey the profile of night slanted against morning. I turn this way, the stone lets me go. I turn that way, I'm inside the Vietnam Veterans Memorial again, depending on the light to make a difference. I go down the 58,022 names, half expecting to find my own in letters like smoke. I touch the name Andrew Johnson. I see the booby traps white flash. Names shimmer on a woman's blouse, but when she walks away, the names stay on the wall. Brush strokes flash, a red bird's wings cutting across my stair. The sky, a plane in the sky, a white vet's image floats closer to me, then his pale eyes look through mine. I'm a window. He's lost his right arm inside the stone. In the black mirror, a woman's trying to erase names. No, she's brushing a boy's hair. Komenyaka's speaker sees his black face fade, hiding inside the black granite of the Vietnam Veterans Memorial. The poem perfectly captures the experience of the visit and of the reflective granite surface of the memorial. You see your own reflection, and it's as if your soul double stares back into your own eyes. Komenyaka constructs how this reflection works, outside and inside the wall, back in the war, the reflection inside the wall. Standing in front of the wall, looking back, what is real, what is not, even life and death. Komenyaka explores his internal terrain through the voice of this autobiographical speaker right before our eyes. Perhaps it all boils down to being awake and aware and alive. Noticing. It has to do with waiting to write the poetry we truly need to write instead of bullying something into being 
for the sake of making. I must have written 200 poems on the subject of sadness until I watched my mother die in front of me. And I awoke and I became aware. And I felt keenly alive in that moment. And then I knew despair. And even then it took me a year to authentically write it. And so I waited and I listened and I tasted it and I smelled it. I realized one day it had been over a year since my mother's voice had last filled my ears. Sitting on my back porch, I heard the two boys from up the road playing at killing one another. This is a game that boys play. I heard one yell, that's not how it sounds when somebody dies. I listened. A few nights later, from the same porch, I heard a newborn calf put in a hutch and separated from its mother, talking to her from across the pasture. A year had passed, but these were unbelievably difficult moments. I would have given anything to hear my mother's audible voice. The sound of a loved one's death is distinct and unforgettable. Mostly, though, death winds up sounding like silence. Sometimes that silence breaks in ways we least expect. This is the poem that came from that moment. It came from me. Is it good poetry? I hope so. I hope a reader feels what I felt in that moment. Is it good poetry? I'm certainly grateful an editor saw fit to publish it. It closes out Troubler, my second book, but I, I share it not so much to recommend my own poetry, but to say, sometimes you write a poem and you know that this one, this one, has gotten close to what you want a poem to do. To sound like a real person is talking, capturing a moment of action when something happened that was important that couldn't be summed up in some abstraction. Reverberations by Elijah Burrell. One day I heard the neighbor boys make war. I recognized the sounds. One yelled, I got you, you're dead. The other shrieked from the ghost bullet, chest blown open. That's not how it sounds when someone dies, the first boy yelled. Once I called her number and let it ring for the voicemail, but reached the number that had been disconnected or was no longer in service. There are so many ways to hear it. A robin flies away from its nest, disappears into sunlight, that quiet. Today it's exactly that quiet. But last night I sat on the back porch and listened to the newborn calf bellow from its hutch across the pasture. From the far darkness, its mother called out. From the far darkness, its mother. What makes good poetry? You know it when you see it. It grabs hold of you. It's like a machine or a freshly tuned instrument or a living organ built by fresh language. A true voice speaks in a good poem. A good poem carries a sense of weight. It's a poem you can't help but return to. It moves, it pulses like a heartbeat. Its images contain emotional density. And don't forget, you'll know a good poem when it sings and speaks to you something true about life and the struggles and joys each of us face. Good poetry is a severed ear, a bouquet of wildflowers. It's a slain albatross wringing the neck of a salt-crusted mariner. It's a drop of water hanging, shaking, trembling a delta of juices bursting down a chin, names shimmering on a woman's blouse, a newborn calf bellowing from its hutch to its lost mother. It is entirely possible none of us will know what a good poem is until we've filled our minds with poetry. Like a vast sea or a small lake, with tributaries continually feeding into us, and not just the poems or the poets that make us feel comfortable, but the ones that claw at us, that show us reality can be dark as well water, 
that terrify us and how they are deeply human, how they are full like rich dreams and stubbornly refuse to be defined. Thank you very much.